And welcome back, everyone, to yet another episode of Going for Two, presented by Home Field Apparel. I am your host, the publisher of the Extra Points newsletter, uh, Matt Brown, uh, coming at you here from marginally sunnier Chicago, Illinois. I am joined, uh, as always, or as almost always, by my colleague and friend, Brian Fisher, who's wrapping things up with the spring conference meetings in suburban Phoenix. Brian, it is a pleasure to see you. I, I'm sure, and I, I've moved inside, so it's not to make you jealous of, of the sun, but also to get out of the, the heat. But I uh, appreciate uh, j joining you again, and uh, it's been a fun week. I'm, I'm excited to, to go home, certainly. it's uh, It's been a lot of uh, meetings and, and uh, catching up, but uh, at the end of the day, you just, just want to get home. And I think a lot of the ADs who have been in meetings for a long, long time are certainly on the same page as I am. Yeah, it's always great to get out of our basements. It's great to get away from the children that we love unconditionally um, and maybe get a good night's sleep once in a while. But also there's a limit to how many meetings you can do, how much Zoom you could do and how much business small talk you could do. Um, I'm excited for this episode because we're gonna we're actually going to talk to somebody. And we, I, want, I want to spend some time with the rest of your, your Phoenix trip. And I think we'll do that a little bit next week, too. But this 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 episode is I think is as interesting as it gives us a chance to talk to an expert of a sport that you know much better than I do, and I suspect both of us don't know that well, which is college soccer. And if you are unaware, uh, while we spent a lot, the collective we have spent an enormous amount of time talking about enormous structural changes happening to college football and college basketball, because there are those things happening. There could be some pretty significant changes happening in men's college soccer. There is a movement among many uh, college soccer coaches and supported by many college soccer athletes to change the schedule. And rather than trying to compress everything in the fall, but spread the sport out over two semesters and have uh, the men's soccer NCAA championships and whether that people will actually want to be outside for uh, and where it's not running up against literally every other part of the college sports calendar. Uh, so we, we've, we've been we've been lucky. We're able to talk to one of the college coaches that's been a real uh, catalyst and engine behind that legislative process to help us maybe understand a little bit better about how all this stuff is working. Right. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting uh, kind of microcosm of, of what's happening within the NCAA, right? There, there's so many changes going on that uh, this, this has almost kind of been, been overshadowed, but it, it's a huge thing for college soccer. And look, I, I, I am a big soccer fan. I was was sitting there uh, during meetings, actually watching some of the Champions League uh, game as well as, you know, and, and, and uh, as saying hello to everybody. And, uh, you know, it, it's just wild to think that, uh, you know, this sport uh, really has kind of been been overlooked in terms of the amount of change that, that's needed to happen. And th there's not been much, you know, to the sport uh, over the last couple of decades. And this is a proposal, this 21st century model. We, we've done a couple of Collegiate Sports Connect videos over it. Uh, it it's something that some of these coaches, and, and we'll, we'll talk with uh, Sa Sasha Swarovski uh, of the Maryland uh, Men's Soccer Program about it in, in a second here. But uh, this is something they've been trying to do for 10 years. You know, like I, I, I was talking with somebody at the Big Ten, like this is a, this is a thing that has, has been – constantly brought up it has been been pushed as as much as they, they can be but uh just when they're almost getting over to the finish line a, a couple of weeks ago in terms of getting a, a council vote it ends up getting getting pushed back because of everything else going on so yeah uh, I, I know it's been frustrating for, for a lot of those coaches but um you know this is essentially as we talk about it being a world cup year there's been some calendar changes in terms of the professional game to accommodate that moving to the winter um you know college football fans are, are going to end up seeing that because not only is, is fox televising the world cup this year but it's it's going to overrun and overlap with college football so you're going to have some some different tv windows than, than you're used to and uh truthfully this is something that the the men's soccer um, folks have really wanted to uh, kind of bring those you know normal changes i, I guess to, to revert back to the the normal calendar uh and, and cadence that that uh, men's soccer has, has followed for for a long time followed it overseas certainly even in, in this country with, with some of the uh, schedules that uh, say high school athletes are, are experiencing so um it, it's going to be a, an interesting time then and hopefully we can get into this 21st century model uh with sasha and, and kind of dive in a, a little bit in terms of uh, what 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 it ultimately is and uh, how it can really help the game of, of soccer that uh, I, I know a lot of coaches uh, are, are for it yeah, why don't we go turn the time over to Sasha right now to better understand what's happening and why it's happening and why you, uh, probably a college soccer casual, um, but or somebody that that is at least somewhat invested in NCAA reform, should care about this. So let's turn the time over to him real quick. Brian Fisher here with D1 Ticker and Collegiate Sports Connect. Happy to be joined by my podcast partner in crime, Matt Brown of Extra Points. And uh, from the Maryland men's soccer uh, program, one of the national championship winning coaches, uh, Sasha Shorofsky, thanks for joining us. I appreciate uh, you jumping on with us. Brian, Matt, great to be with you. Thanks for having me on the show. 
Absolutely. And the reason we wanted to have you on, we, we've had a lot of discussion about the 21st century model. And uh, for fans out there, administrators who, who maybe have not uh, come across this proposal, I, I guess if you could give us a little bit of a background uh, for us on this, because uh, this is something you've been, you've been working on in, in particular for a very long time. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, the, the 21st century model is um, is an attempt to uh, modernize the college soccer playing and practice season with, with the men's game. Um, I think all of us have been involved in the game. I've been involved for 40 years. Uh, I've, I've noticed from, from the very beginning that uh, what we're doing in college soccer with a traditional season and a non-traditional season, you know, it's, you've got 132 days. It's an archaic model. Uh, it, it's something that is not an, an optimal experience for student athletes on so many different levels. And we've attempted to try to find solutions to modernize college soccer to be more in line with what happens at the youth level and what happens at the professional level. Uh, and we've We've been at this for almost 10 years now. This is actually the second attempt that Division One men's college coaches have tried to do things. There was an attempt in early 2000. Um, and we're close to the finish line now. We, we hope to have a vote on this uh, by mid-June. I'm hoping today that the legislative committee of the NCAA uh, pulls out this for a vote in June. Uh, but this is a very big passion for us. Um, we think we can grow the college game. We think it's the right thing for the players. Our hashtag, it's simple. It's for the players. It's for the game. This is the most popular sport in the world. It has tremendous potential within the NCAA. And we have not grown the sport. Um, college soccer has not grown at all for the last 40 years that I've been involved in as a player, assistant coach, head coach. Um, and all of us are very uh very keen on trying to help move the game forward and provide a much better experience for the 5,500 kids that play soccer. Uh, Sasha, this, this makes a lot of sense, I think. And, and as Brian and I have talked to other coaches and other people involved in this ecosystem, and we've definitely seen a lot of support for this model from athletes, you know, particularly you know, what, what the athletes that are excited about not having to play so many games in a compressed schedule, which is, which is better for their health. The, the only constituent group or one of the few constituent groups that we've heard raise some concerns about this tend to be administrators and support personnel at smaller D1 institutions, folks that are concerned, do we have enough athletic trainers? Do we have enough sports information communication professionals to accommodate a, a now busier spring schedule? And I'm wondering maybe what you or some of your colleagues might say to maybe somebody that doesn't have, is not blessed with the same institutional resources yeah. that maybe you have at Maryland. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think that the staffing issue uh, has always been a concern in terms of how do you do this if all of a sudden now you are competing over both semesters. The reality of the situation is if you're a Division One athlete right now, you are competing year round. You are, uh, you know, you're using your 132 days, you're using your 20 hours a week, you're doing a lot of individual work. So you're doing that already. So the minimum expectation is that these universities are providing healthcare with athletic trainers and support services already during that time period. But what happens in our schedule right now is, you know, we're playing 20 games in about 80 days, a game every four days in the fall, which is unhealthy, which is very suboptimal. Uh, you, you, kids get injured. You, there's all kinds of issues with that. Right. And then in the spring, we play five friendly games over 50 days. So you're playing a game every 10 days. You're playing a game every four days here. Um, so, so it's like, wait a second. You know, when you when you think about this holistically, you say, okay, we have this limitation of 132 days. We're doing this already. Um, so what we've called our model is a redistribution of the two seasons into one season that makes more sense, where our championships can also flourish. It's the same thing with staffing. It's a redistribution of athletic trainers, maybe with different sports. So maybe it's if it's soccer and lacrosse, maybe now it's soccer and tennis or or, or those things. And, and with the sports information directors, you know, right now we're, we're actually going to play exactly the same amount of competitive games as we do now. So you're supposed to play 20 in the fall. We're only playing 20 regular season games in the new model. So we've actually reduced the number of games to make it more palatable to reduce the impact on redistribution of staffing. And by the way, keep in mind, it's a redistribution for coaches as well. Um, so we have to, you know, go through a, a few changes as well, but we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Um, now, if it forces some of the schools to actually be held accountable on providing health care and support services, then that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And, and I, I get frustrated when I hear people make excuses. Uh, we can't, you know, we can't staff it. Well, that's a bunch of baloney, in all honesty. Okay, we put five sports at the 11th hour during COVID and we made them all work in the spring. 
Okay. Administrators are very skilled. Trainers leave. I've had trainers leave halfway through my competitive season. I've had sports information directors leave halfway through my competitive season. I've lost an assistant coach halfway through my competitive season. We figure it out. The overwhelming reason we're doing this is not for the Sasha Swarovskis of the world. It's for the student athletes. It's to provide them with a better, safer, healthier collegiate experience that, that involves a better balance of social, academic, and soccer life. So this is why we're doing it. And we're also doing it because our championships in the fall from mid-November to December cannot grow. We go radio silent. There is no television coverage. It's the most competitive sports media calendar of the year. So you're playing your most meaningful games with very little television coverage and very few people in the stands because we're playing in freezing weather in winter, our championships. And we all know you get measured by the success of your sport, your significance, on the quality of your championship experience. So why are we stuck in this, you know, uh, you know, I call it, uh, you know, square hole in a round box or whatever, whatever the saying goes. <laughs> it, yeah. It makes no sense. And here's the thing. I'm an educator. We work at the leading educational institutions in the world. We teach our kids all the time. Think outside the box. Be adaptable. Be, flex be flexible. Find solutions when you have a problem. We're doing all of those other things. So now we're providing a solution right now that with all solutions, there's going to be a learning curve. There's going to be some adjustment, but when it's the right thing to do, you do the right thing. You know, that's what Dr. Martin Luther King told us. It's never too late to do the right thing. It's always the right time, right? So, yeah. and by the way, John F. Kennedy also said, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So I think people need to find solutions rather than create problems of why not to do the right thing. I mean, this is obviously a, coming at, at an interesting time in, in, in the NCA, right? We're, we're talking about uh, uh, certainly NIL. There's a lot of conversations right here in, in Arizona where I'm at uh, in terms of the meetings about the structure of the NCA, the transformation committee that, that's going on. Uh, I'm curious, like, like we said earlier, you've been trying to do this for, for nearly a decade now, trying to get something passed like this. How, how frustrating has that been, you know, within the working within the NCA apparatus, going through all your committees that you've had to, you've already had the, the, the vote delayed by the D1 council already this summer. Uh, I mean, when you're looking at this model in general uh, and, and how it's kind of reflective of, of the NCA process, are, are, are you hopeful for the future that there can be changes to where you can make these uh, th things happen a little bit quicker? Or is this just kind of the, the things that you guys have been dealing with for, for much of the past decade? No, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not surprised we are where we are with the NCAA right now. I think one of the reasons we are where we are now with, with NIL and the Alston case and conference realignment is, is a frustration level of not being able to adapt and change and move things forward. Mm -hmm. Our model is a transformational model. It's an evolutionary model and a better solution for the student athletes. Why? Because we're listening to the student athletes. The coaches, the practitioners, the student athletes have met and talked about what makes sense for us. And yet it's taken us 10 years to even get close to the finish line. And yet we still have some, you know, kind of ridiculous opposition to a very common sense solution, partly because the structure and institutionalized nature of the NCAA has not been able to adapt to move forward, to move anything forward. Think about it, Brian. There are three things that affect change within the current structure of the NCAA. It's revenue sports, or if there's something of a, of a, of a monetary benefit. Two, it's, it's gender equity driven. And three, there's litigation, there's a lawsuit. Okay, we don't qualify in any of those three things. We've actually sat here, been a, a shining example of patience and persistence and resolve. We've collaborated. Every single coach in Division I men's soccer has opportunity to chime in. Every student athlete has been pulled three different times by our coaching associations, but also by the NCAA. The information is there. We have met with committee members, everyone else, people know this, and yet it's still very difficult to get over the finish line because of the committee structure, because the NCAA has been set up to keep the status quo. It has not been set up to move things forward. It's more worried about putting stumbling blocks rather than opening up the doors to things moving forward. So I am not surprised where we are, but I am hopeful that whatever the new NCAA looks like, whether it's one, two, three buckets, that there's more like-minded institutions that think the same similarly in those buckets where you can make change much quicker and that we can adapt much quicker. 
Yeah, I, I think on that note, speaking of, of, of adapting much uh, more quick, more quickly, one of the things that I think may be of interest to our audience that's not as familiar with college soccer is that this is a, a very different player pool than you might have for, say, college football or college basketball, because prospective athletes have so many other options outside of the collegiate system. They might participate in some kind of you know, MLS a youth development system. They might be able to go professional. They might go play overseas. And also you can recruit overseas. You, everyone in the world plays soccer. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, do you envision the potential player pool for maybe a, either a program like Maryland or maybe a Division One player pool generally um, expanding in any way it, by, by changing this model? Do you think that, that this might make college soccer more attractive for a different kind of potential athlete? That's a great question. Look, I, I think if we adopt a version of the 21st century model, we can have the best 18 to 24 year old platform in the world for aspiring soccer players and also adding the unique experience of academics and soccer blended for a good cause. Uh, we're already getting top players from, you know, big clubs all over the world from Bayern Munich, Manchester United, Barcelona are coming to American colleges, partly because they value the education. They cannot have that experience in their own country. But secondly, because of the opportunities in the U S now to have a career in sports uh, in soccer. MLS, USL, MLS Pro, there's there's over 100 professional teams just in the U.S. alone now, but then there is thousands all over the world. So, yes, there is a, a great market for top players, but I truly believe that we have an opportunity here to be an incredible league and to have a championship played in May and early June that can become a big deal. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I, I look at, you know, uh, college baseball, college lacrosse, ice hockey, you, you, all of these are winter spring championships. And, and it, it's it's much easier to uh, to create a buzz during that time period. Plus, if you think about, you know, MLS is just starting. Champions League is, is finishing. Build up to World Cup is happening. Soccer is on the minds of kids who are playing and people who are watching. And we are missing an incredible opportunity to grow our sport. Uh, it, it was interesting talking with some, some folks about the model in terms of the, the support from the, the U.S. Soccer Federation. I, I know you've I, I mean, your, your wife has obviously been in, intimately involved uh, ha, been, being a, a National Hall of Famer and, and working for the women's national team as well. Uh, w when you look at uh, the we're really college ecosystem, how does it fit within uh, you know, the, the American soccer cult culture and where is it going from here? Because uh, we, we've kind of hit on it a little bit, but uh, there are so many more avenues for, for things. But th there's a lot of hope with the world cup coming in, in a couple of years, this is obviously a world cup as, as well. Uh, where, where is, uh, you know, the NCAA soccer kind of going from here and, and how does that player pool kind of help with, with MLS and, and, and sending it to other leagues? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, college soccer has become a bit of an Island because we have not had really many advancements in our game, whether it's the playing season or even our, some of our rules. Um, and, and we, we haven't grown. So I think U.S. soccer has been frustrated by that, and they found other ways to help provide opportunities for some of their players. Major League Soccer, same thing. Uh, we, we are trying to become a more a part of the ecosystem in this country that makes sense uh, in, in terms of what we do within the NCAA. Look, in, in the U.S., in, in America, the goal for everyone is to go to college. Of course, we have players that want to play professionally, but the college experience is – is, is what everybody strives for. Education is important here. College sports are important. And it's a frustration of people. Everywhere I go, I get encouragement. Please pass this model. Do whatever you can. Don't stop. Don't stop. Because we need college soccer to get fixed for the young kids who are going to college, for the kids that want to play beyond that. So, so we get a lot of encouragement all the way around. But, yeah, we have become a bit of an island, Brian. I mean, we really have. You know, we, I, I've used it a couple of times that we've been almost a laughing stock of the soccer world. It's incredible that our 14 to 18-year-old prospective student athletes, you know, of which 98% of the kids will come play for us in college, 2% might go pro. These kids are already doing the 21st century model right now. They're playing for their high schools and clubs. They're playing from August until June. That's what they're doing. And they come to college. And all of a sudden, now you say, no, you can play, what, 17 real games in the fall, have your championships, and then seven of your games will be just friendlies over two, over the two semesters. And it, it's just very unbalanced. And when you understand the nature of our sport, the physical demands, the technical demands, the emotional demands, and then you add in now the larger conferences and the travel that goes in between, I mean, it, 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 it takes a fifth grader to realize 
This is a model that has to pass. Let me ask you something else about that that I think is unique about this sports schedule compared to other major college sports. Is this, like, this idea of this of this friendly uh, season uh, set up right now in the spring, which yeah. is not yeah. something that every other sport has. <clears throat> One thing that some coaches at maybe smaller institutions have mentioned to me is, you know, we recognize that this current model is not ideal. But one of the benefits of the status quo is that it makes it easier for us to carry very large roster sizes into the spring because maybe some players that would be reserves or might not be on scholarship can play in some of these friendlies. And if I'm a smaller institution whose major goal for having a men's soccer program is enrollment management rather than necessarily athlete development or competing yeah. for championships, I want to do whatever I can to keep everybody on my roster happy so they don't transfer or do something else. And there was a concern that maybe this system might make it harder to do that. Is that a concern that any other coach has ever raised to you throughout this system? Yeah, I've heard that. I think, I think, you know, we might have five to 7% of the coaches that might feel that way uh, you yeah. know, to be fair. And I think you're always going to have that. I, I totally disagree with that narrative. Um, I think what you have right now is you have a roster set of 28 players. You, you, you get into your competitive season. Preseason is way too short. So it's hard to analyze, you know, who's your starters, who's not. You start playing games. You play a game every three and a half to four days. You hardly ever get to train with your whole squad. So your squad gets divided into two. And imagine being one of those players that maybe is a player between, you know, 18 and 28 on your squad. That player rarely ever gets to train with the first team or the rotational team. So they never get a real opportunity to compete in a periodization model that we're proposing with the first team. So, so then what you have, so, so it's your first semester in school, you're barely playing and, and you, you know, you, you start, you know, losing confidence. Yeah. You, 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 you start losing your place and you start thinking, is this the right place? And I'm going to transfer. We actually think transfers will be decreased significantly because teams will keep the same roster for the full academic year versus right now where we never have the same roster for the full academic year because kids either graduate, they go pro or they transfer at mid year. So this actually keeps your team more united and gives more people an opportunity, a longer pathway to prove themselves. And if it doesn't work out, they might leave other places. So I, I, I just think that it, it, it's a much better, more holistic model than the current model that we're doing. Put it this way. If you closed your eyes, you said you got 132 days. Give me a soccer model the way you'd want to play. There's nobody in their right mind will say, hey, let's have a competitive season here and let's have a practice season here. I mean, nobody would say that. Now, yeah, I want to keep it this way for, for various reasons. I'm not sure why, but that's the way I would look at it. That I mean, that makes sense. And, and maybe we, the collective, we haven't done a good enough job of really articulating how much, how the, the challenges of, of having training time during this kind of compressed schedule. If you're playing right. these two games and you're traveling and maybe you're not somebody that uh, has a sports specific practice field or you have to share things with somebody else. And if you're only getting to work on tactics once every other week, Certainly, I could understand how uh, you may not be able to get the same kind of player development that you might with where you can dedicate more time to actually practicing. Um, I can see why that would be a, a safety consideration as well. Yeah, not only that, but, you know, look, I, I, you know, I'm in the locker room every day with these players and we play a lot of we play like five or six midweek games right now and trying to get your players to play a midweek game on a Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday night in a highly competitive game and then turn around and, you know, get home at three in the morning the next day uh, to go to class. It, it's impossible. But the quality of games suffer. In the current model, there's only three games all year where I feel my team is fully prepared emotionally, physically, tactically, where we've had at least three full days of training leading into a game. And that's it, three times all year. So how can you grow a sport? How can you provide a product on, on there that you want people to pay to watch? Where, 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 where people are not risking injury. Right now, the fall is about survival. It's not about thriving, you know, and, and it's, it's an emotionally challenging time. And, and, and uh, yeah, it, it's just very difficult. I just wish people would actually be in a locker room and go in the training room. This is why 86% of the kids currently enrolled want to play in a two-semester model. You tell me anything, you get 86% of the people to agree on anything right now. They might not agree that the sky is actually blue or, the, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, 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 you're telling us. I, I, I just have one last question. And then, and, and Brian, by all means, if, if you had any other ones, but the, the, the last thing I'm, I'm curious about is why these conversations aren't happening in parallel the same way on the women's side 
presumably if a compressed schedule and these and these uh, emotional and physical training challenges are an issue for men's soccer, I would assume they would be similar for, for women. Do you, do you know why um, we're, we're not having the same conversation or these, these, these problems haven't been articulated the same way? Yeah, I think it's probably easier to ask some of the women's coaches that question, but I'll, I'll give you a sense of the way I see it. Um, yeah. I, so I think there's a, a large group of coaches, maybe even over 50 percent, that really want to have a serious conversation on the women's side about this. Um, and I think there's a, a, you know, maybe another half of the coaches that sort of like where they are right now and don't feel a need to change right now. And I think there's two parts to this answer. Number one, you know, women's soccer really started to become an NCAA sport in the mid 80s. Um, and from mid 80s, they went from about 40 schools to about 340 schools. Um, we, we, in the 1980s, we were about 200 schools. We're still at 200 schools. Um, the, the global game in the men's side has grown and we, we have dealt with more questions, I guess, and crises to try to find a solution to grow and provide an experience. I guess we're a little bit more motivated. It's almost like you're looking at yeah. an industry, right? You have, you have a current industry that's mature and not grown and you have an industry that's grown like this. Well, this is, the, this is the industry that's talking about change. This is the industry that is not talking about change. So I, what I've heard from a lot of my counterparts is like, look, we'd love you guys to do it. We want to watch how it goes for you. <laughs> sure, yeah. We, we, we want to see, we, you know, if three, four, five years, we love it, we're going to come on board. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, 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 the sort of messaging we've had uh, with the women. That, that, ma- that makes sense. Sasha, I'm, I'm curious, you know, your, your AD is, is one of the, the ADs on the transformation committee. What, what kind of conversations have you had with, with him just about the, the future of the NCAA? And, and I'm also kind of curious in, in terms of your program in particular, how, how you guys have approached NIL, because that has been uh, really the hot, top, hot right. button topic that, that everybody has been discussed. Is NIL something that can really help enhance college soccer and, and, and help your programs uh, not only attract better talent, but uh, retain it as well? Yeah. So the first part of that question, uh, my, my, my AD, Damon Evans, has been awesome. He, he is a real transformational guy. I'm glad he's on the transformational committee. Damon uh, really is a guy that listens to the student athletes and listens to the coaches. Um, so he's been on board uh, with this the whole time. He gets it. He understands it. He supports it um, b- because he, he comes to the games and he sees, sees what we're doing. He supports it. Um, so he's been terrific that way. Uh, as far as the NIL space, hasn't affected us too much lately. Um, to be honest, I've been so busy trying to get a 21st century model <laughs> over the finish line. I haven't probably done a good enough job to think about collectives and ways that can enhance my program just yet. Uh, I, I'm really hopeful that somehow Congress comes in and puts a leash or some guardrails around the NIL space. Um, I, I, you know, I want our players to have proper opportunity to make to make name image and likeness but right now this is the wild wild west and it's kind of getting out of hand a little bit it's going to have uh, i think too many more unintended negative effects than it was uh intended to do um i do think that uh there is opportunity for us to uh with the nil legislation uh to open up the doors for more players to come into college experience because the amateurs are moves a little bit loosened and a lot of players uh, it might give players an opportunity to test the waters professionally a little bit more even before they come to school, which is what we do with most of the international kids, but it might offer the opportunity for some uh, domestic kids to do the same thing now. So I think there's some advantages with the loosening of the amateurism rules. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm a little worried about how we're going to pay for all this. Um, you know, yeah. uh, the whole NIL thing was, you know, boosters having control over paying players is just kind of uh, – a, a road I'm I'm not too happy with right now. I hope we can find some solutions so it's a little bit more controlled. And, and the other thing that, that, that there's been a lot of conversations about recently has been student athlete m- mental health. Uh, yeah. I'm curious how how that is enhanced with, with with this move to the 21st century model, and and truthfully how you've dealt with things just kind of popping up uh, over the last couple of years. Have the student athletes themselves been been more open to changes and and, and going to people uh, on campus? How, how have you seen the, the reaction at, at Maryland and, and other places uh, to, to assisting uh, th- those athletes as they uh, deal with all the all the problems on their plate right now? Look, you know. The health of our student athletes is the number one priority why we're pushing a 21st century model. It helps in so many different areas. You know, you look at concussions as an example. We have more time in between games. There's less of a push for players to fight their way back and even, you know, try to cajole the, the sports medicine experts to get back on the field. They miss fewer games. 
with, with fewer injuries and with the games being spaced up. But mental health is a real, real thing. And, and I think right now the runway of the, of the first experience of college players in the fall, of having 20 congested games in a two-month period on your first academic semester is, 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 is way too much to handle. I, I am seeing more and more kids dealing with, with anxiety and depression every single year it mostly happens in the fall semester because it's just too much to take. It's hard for coaches to even have the time to do proper individual meetings and, and to have enough time to visit with everybody. So I do think that we will lessen the burden, hopefully, of more mental health or emotional anxiety problems by this model because we'll stretch out the week. We give a little more time in between uh, you know, the, the stresses of travel and competing and, and, and playing time and all of these things that are real for these kids, it just makes so much sense. We are here during the whole academic year. This, thing, this model used to be called the academic year model because we just took the time that we're here and just properly redistributed and rebalanced out the schedule. And, and I do think there'll be tremendous in so many, there'll be fewer transfers. I think fewer kids will deal with, with, with uh, mental issues. And if, and if they have something, we can see it and we can do something more about it because we have time in between games to properly address it. So I, I just see all wins out of this stuff. And, and, you know, we keep using the word modernization and transformation. That's what this model is. This is a modernization transformation model that we talked about 10 years ago. Um, and now here we are 10 years later now talking about these things. And this is a good example of something that should move forward at the next opportunity. Well, it'll certainly be something that we will keep our, our, our eyes on and uh, hopefully we'll get over the cross the finish line for, for you and a lot of coaches out there. But uh, Sasha, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, guys, thank you so much, Matt and Brian. I really appreciate the, the platform. Uh, I want to unpack a little bit about what we, just, what we just talked about. But before we do, I would be remiss if I did not take this opportunity to talk about our cherished title sponsor, Home Field Apparel. It is a very unusual time for Brian and I to be addressing you where we are both wearing shirts with buttons. I'm wearing a jacket. I'm actually wearing like actual pants, uh, which is instead of instead of gym shorts or maybe my home field uh, joggers. So I can't just jump up and point and showcase what I'm wearing. Again, home field, make some blazers. You know, we, we talked about this last week. We're in the market for some obnoxious bowl blazers. We would prefer that you make them. What home field does make um, are the most comfortable the most unique, the most interesting officially licensed collegiate apparel, especially for stuff for the upper body region, whether that's a hoodie or a crew neck or a t-shirt or a long sleeve shirt or a tank top, if you have been blessed with muscles uh, or just somebody that wants to go outside and not be sweating as much. All of those things are, are on home field apparel. And they're, they're not just the same designs you see in every friggin' university bookstore. They got the good stuff. They got the weird stuff. The logos that your university used back in the 30s, back in the 60s before they had things like lawyers or quality control or anybody to tell you that maybe animals shouldn't, your mascot shouldn't be surfing. Of course they should. Now people will probably tell you that's a bad idea. Homefield got a hold of all those things. They put them on t-shirts. They're truly outstanding. Um, yeah, I, but, I, I personally cannot wait to uh, to get back home and change into some of my home field stuff, especially after uh, experiencing some of the, the temperatures and uh, doing so in, in, in a button up. It, it's been it's been different, uh, but I, I can't wait to get back into the, those home field things. And it's, it's funny running into a, a few ADs that I know that uh, probably had some in, in their suitcases as well. As they should. So we're, we're still a couple of weeks away from Big News Saturday, which is like the next launch of a bunch of schools that aren't uh, that, that haven't been on on home field before. But what they've been doing on a week to week basis is doing refreshes and renewals. Uh, we just spent a lot of time talking about Maryland. They got some great home field stuff on Maryland. They uh, they just released a new kind of goldenrod shirt with an angry turtle that says "Go Terps" on it. Um, we we uh, our family used to live in PG County. My wife did not go to Maryland, but she owns multiple home field Maryland shirts. If you want something that says "Fear the Turtle," uh, some kind of uh, weird anthropomorphic, uh, violent terrapin like thing, they've got it. They've got Air Force, which they just added. I believe Fairfield is 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 dropping right now. So if you want to go, if you haven't done this yet. And I would be a little surprised if you haven't, because we've been begging you to do this. Or not begging. We've been politely exhorting you to do this for several weeks now. Grab uh, some home field stuff and save 15% off your order by using promo code extra points. And if you are an athletic director or a conference office uh, conference uh, officer or somebody that works in, in sponsorships and you're wondering how to get all the other people on the internet to buy your stuff, 
my email is matt at extrapointsmb.com. I will be happy to introduce you to the good folks at The Good Brand in Indianapolis. Uh, I think I'd also just very quickly mention before we wrap up here for the week that if you have listened to us enthusiastically and creatively shill for our friends at home field, um, let it be known. We're also happy to shill for, or shill for you. I mean, not, not, not if you're like selling drugs or something, but if you're selling a product or a service that might appeal to an audience of college athletics, diehards and media members and industry practitioners, we would love to be able to work with you. We have affordable rates we ha and, and, and high quality audience engagement metrics. We also have advertising opportunities available on Extra Points, which is the newsletter that hopefully all of you subscribe to as well. If you think that maybe your content is better for uh, sent in the text format rather than audio, the email address to talk about those things is sales at extrapointsmb.com. Um, I am fascinated by how this goes, not because I am so much a diehard college soccer fan. I candidly, I am not. And I think the older that I get, the harder it's going to be for me to jump into a completely new college sport, unless I'm watching it here for work. But the idea of coaches really elevating themselves and working together to advocate for their sport and push for changes, I think is interesting because even at a place like Maryland, which, and this is no disrespect to Maryland's administration, Maryland is a school that has a really great and deep and rich um, non revenue sport tradition. Maryland is awesome at men's and women's lacrosse. They are, have been a consistently excellent men's and women's soccer program. They're great at field hockey. They're great at a bunch of other things. But if you are Maryland's athletic director, your senior administration, so much of your focus has to be on football. And it has to be on men's and women's basketball. And increasingly, it's on NIL. It's on preventing litigation. It's on taking the green line into the city and, and trying to, to beg for some congressmen to bail you out. It's on things that have nothing to do with soccer or field hockey. And that's all, unfortunately also true for a lot of associate athletic directors. And what the, the complaint that I've heard, I heard this a lot from baseball coaches, but I've heard this from other coaches as well, is if we aren't the ones who are really aggressively advocating for ourselves, no one else is going to do it because they just, they simply don't have the capacity to make this the biggest priority. And so I, I know I am a little bit self, I mean, not selfishly, but I'm rooting for this to be successful, even on those merits, rather than my deep, my deep feel, my deep seated opinions about when we should be playing college soccer games. Yeah, I mean, really, the Sasha kind of got into it. it. You know, there's not much of a, a voice for coaches in kind of the NCAA apparatus unless they push for it themselves, right? And and like, yeah, there might be a single coach on a single committee. Uh, you know, usually some of the the football like football oversight has a direct you know direct member from from the coaching community on it. Um, but there's just not the consistent voice. And you know, a lot of those coaches are are quite busy. You know, some some might not uh, in, embrace the mission to uh, advocate for uh, some of them. Others, it, it's been interesting. You know, like Todd. Barry from the AFCA has been around these meetings. He's obviously, uh, you know, been very vocal in terms of the, 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 uh, you know, publicity and, and whatnot he's trying to bring to the oh, football yeah. side of changes um, in terms of like the scholarship limits, the, the NIL uh, guardrails and whatnot. Um, but for other sports, there's not really kind of that apparatus that it certainly does not get the amount of press uh, that, that somebody like, you know, in the sport of football does. So, um, you know, it's always good to talk with the, the coaches themselves uh, about what they're seeing. And, um, you know, this is certainly a very interesting model uh, when, when you look at where the NCAA ecosystem fits within. Uh, it, it's not even an emerging sport any, anymore. You know, this is a, a, a growing sport still but uh you know the the headway that uh you know they're, they're still left to to hit uh for for college soccer in particular i think is one of those things that when you look at the media rights deals and, and you look at things like uh you know getting sent i, I know everybody focuses on on sports like women's basketball but there, there, there's a lot of runway left for ncaa soccer to be a little bit more prominent than it than it can be and i, I think that's you know the, the not necessarily the driving factor behind this this uh 21st century model but uh it, it is a contributing factor in terms of um, you know, they, they think they can really grow the game. And so uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, yeah, I, I do anticipate a, a vote end up happening, uh, you know, in June. So we'll, we'll see uh, ultimately what those results are. But I, I do think there's, there's, um, you know, some, some budding momentum for uh, these changes coming to men's soccer. And it's, it's coming at, at a time on the calendar, really, that, uh, you know, not only is everything happening for, for other sports, but it, it's an important time on the soccer calendar, not only is it a world cup year, but I think everybody from the U S soccer federation uh, on down, you know, are really gearing up to knowing that we we're going to have a world cup, you know, in, in this country and how much of a boost that can provide for the grassroots of, of the game, which the NCAA is, is obviously involved in. I would, um, 
I, I mean, I, you're right. Like this, this is definitely the big time here for soccer. I, we, I think we could probably do another 30 minutes just kind of digging into the weeds here. And I know this has gone maybe a little bit longer than we would have expected for a Friday episode. I'm curious if there's anything else just at a very high level about that you've heard of Phoenix before we wrap up here that we want to make sure that we hit now rather than kind of getting into the weeds again over the next week. Uh, well, you know, I, I think there's there's certain things you know floating around there. I, I know there's been uh, been talking. You know, I ran into to George Kalafkov as as he was heading out. Uh, you know, he he went to Washington with Greg Sinke to uh, kind of lobby some senators. Uh, you know, at the end of the week here, and uh, who knows ultimately what kind of progress that they're going to have on that. I, I know it's been, it, it's an interesting time in, in Washington, D.C., given, given everything that has been going on recently. And, and I, I don't think there's, they're, they're going to make much of a dent, um, just given, given yeah. uh, the political nature of this country and, and what the attention and, and focus is uh, in terms of the beltway right now. And, uh, you know, you, you, you could probably speak a little bit more to that, but uh, you know, for the NCAA themselves, look, there, there's, there's a bunch of changes. And I think the, the thing that I've gotten back from, from these meetings is ultimately uh, as much as that August deadline that, uh, the, the division one board said, you know, Hey, we, we want these changes to be kind of done and, and, and debated. I, I, I don't get the sense that that is, that they're going to hit that mark. You know, I think this is going to be something that is going to continue to be discussed going into the fall. There, there's a lot of stuff just, just going on that you have to do practically from a day to day standpoint. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see that the D one council in a, in a couple of weeks is probably going to vote on the, uh, you know, football oversight proposals to kind of strip away the, the 25 man signing limits and, and basically have a hard cap of 85. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's going to be a game changer for coaches, you know, that, that have seen, you know, roster attrition yeah. really hit the, their programs. Uh, the, the transfer portal has been more active than, than ever um, in terms of the number of people that. That went into it. There's been large sagas about, um, you know, guys going in. And I think the, the uh, ability for the uh, council, the NCAA, the, really a lot of groups, you know, hopefully uh, trying to put a little bit of guardrails on, on NIL and, and the inducements that, uh, that they have seen, some of the, the deals that they have seen, um, you know, th that rightfully gets a lot of talk, you know, at, at meetings like this. But, uh, you know, what, what can they do about it? We're, we're going to find out. I, I don't think there's going to be much over the next couple of weeks or, or months um, that we're going to end up seeing in terms of actual tangible progress uh, on some of these big time issues, though. Yeah, a lot of that's going to be questions, I think, for lawyers. And, and we're, we're lucky that we know a few of them and maybe we'll try to bring on some other ones. The, the one thing I think I want to very quickly talk about is that changing of the 25 man limit because i think a lot of the, the chatter i've seen about this on social media has been this is oh, this is a rich get richer kind of move we're going to go back to the houston nut era where you're going to try to sign 45 different people in one recruiting class and then just process people and even with scholarships at the power five level allegedly four-year guaranteed i think we both know that players sometimes do get processed um, against their will if they turn out to not be as good as they were originally thought to be, or if, if, if the depth chart kind of changes a certain way, how different coaches approach that varies a lot by coach. I think it's important to point out, and I'm sure you've heard this too, that the, the, one of the, some of the chief groups that were pushing for this change were not the Alabamas and Ohio States of the world. This was the Mac. This was Kansas. These were some smaller P5 league institutions and even some G5s because they're realizing without this count changing, with the transfer portal, we can't get back to 85 players. So even if it does end up benefiting rich schools, I, I think there's a good argument that at least on paper, it's also going to help smaller schools or less budget advantage schools and also potentially high schoolers who might now be uh, right right now are, are a little bit under the eight ball in the recruiting cycle where a coach might prefer to take a transfer than a high school senior. Yeah, the, the, it's it's basically a shock to the system, right? You know, there's there's been so much a change in terms of the rosters, and it, even in a normal year, it might be difficult if if you're not adding four or five walk-ons to, uh, you know, your your scholarship list. It, it would be difficult in in normal circumstances to get to that 85 man limit for for a lot of these coaches just between injuries, medical retirements, uh, you know, uh, transfers, obviously, uh, you know, going guys going to the NFL that uh, you probably weren't, weren't counting on, you know, uh, before the end of the season. So, uh, you know, the, there, there's all of that that they have to deal with. There's, there's the people that, uh, you know, took advantage of the COVID year and just kind of the, the contracting and expanding roster that, uh, you know, you had to sort, sort out with uh, some of those guys returning. Some of those guys, you know, not only came back for their sixth year, but, you know, ended up transferring. So there's just, there, there, there's a lot of people in the portal now that uh, do not have a place to go. And I think that this, Ultimately, this proposal uh, is going to help them the most. You know, they, it's going to find homes for people that had scholarships elsewhere and and wanted to truly transfer to to an, a better opportunity, but uh, it just was not out there because you know between high school signing uh, classes, you know, filling up between 
taking other transfers that uh, maybe were a bigger priority. Um, you know, it, it, it's uh, you, you run into those caps. And even with the additional uh, seven people that, that they can end up signing, uh, 32 is not, not even cutting it for, for some of these programs, just given the yeah. roster attrition. I mean, you mentioned, you know, Kansas, I saw Lance Leipold the, uh, the other day and like he, he, even at, at taking the most that they could get, they, they're still not getting close to, uh, you know, the even 80, uh, much less 85. And I think they're uh, in the I, low, I, I think they're in the low seventies, which puts yeah, them, this is not hyperbole to me, make an easy Kansas joke. That's not much more of an SCS football team. And if some of those guys get hurt or transfer, which always happens, you literally may be. The Missouri Valley team. Well, that that's what a, a couple of coaches, you know, kind of brought that up is, is, you know, they, they, they don't want to lean the crutch on, on player safety, but they think, you know, if we don't have enough offensive linemen, I mean, there's a lot of programs out there didn't have enough offensive linemen for their spring games. Yeah, you know, that, that's been common and for a while. So, you know, it, it's like, we, we just need some bodies, you know, at some point and, and getting those numbers up, you know, is, is going to be a help because, you know, you're, you're overworking some guys uh, in certain key position groups. And it's one thing to have uh, be a little light, uh, you know, a wide receiver, but especially those offensive and defensive linemen, I mean, uh, sometimes you just need some bodies for, for the scout team and uh, they, they're hard to come by if they're, they're walk-ons. And at least this is a way to kind of get those numbers up to where it kind of de- de-stresses the system a little bit, not only in, in terms of the, the teams themselves, but uh, I, I think that the transfer portal and whatnot, and it, it, it's just been a crazy time. And you throw NIL on top of that. I know everybody that, that is the, the focus right now, but um, you know, truthfully the, the coaches themselves, they, they want these type of changes that can really help their roster uh, in, in the short term and in the long term, knowing that uh, you know, they, they're able to replace guys a lot more easy. Cause uh, you know, I, I think it, it, it gets overlooked how easy it is for guys to just enter the portal. And, uh, you know, I think uh, that, that, you know, they might not have a home. Maybe, maybe they've already uh, had some discussions with the high school coaches and whatnot. And yeah, uh, there is concern over the, the quote unquote tampering that that's been happening. Um, but the, the bottom line is some guys just, you know, wake up one day and they go to their compliance office and say, put me in the portal. And, uh, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot uh, that, that these coaches can do about that anymore. And uh, finding replacements for, for some of those guys, um, you know, has, has been a, a difficult task. Yeah. People look, I, I, if I said this once, I've said it a gajillion times. We can't impose our middle-aged dad values on the decision-making process of 19 and 20-year-olds. Sometimes they leave because a booster said they were going to give them 200 grand to leave. Sometimes they leave because they think a booster said that, and it was really some rando on text X, and it turns out there's nothing. Sometimes they leave because they got dumped or because they're homesick or because they realize that the food in their place sucks, they can't get a good barbershop, they're not doing well in school, sometimes they leave because they're impulsive and they're 20. And being stupid is part of being 20. So, like, I mean, and, and this is, you know, people leave school like this for all the time. You would you would expect the athletic portal to be the, to be the same way. I, I honestly do think there is something to be said about the, the safety argument for this particularly along the line of scrimmage and also about the actual student experience somebody has. Cause if you are a, an athlete who is ability to get an effective practice or to develop effectively is constrained by the fact that you're at 68 scholarships and that's where you're going to get the, the tar beaten out of you by Utah on a Thursday night. Cause you have exactly two people to block them. That sucks. Like that, that's the kind of thing that that that, you're, that you that you want to uh, potentially avoid. We're going to have more coverage of the changing legislative bylaws here around recruiting and what that looks like for multiple sports, along with checking in on what's happening here with soccer. Lord knows, I write about name, image, and likeness almost every single day. I think I did it twice this week. I'm uh, working on a couple of other stories. I'm trying to do a little bit more reporting on uh, on extra points and throughout Collegiate Sports Connect. So, real quick, on the off chance that you haven't subscribed to all of our stuff. ExtraPointsMB.com is the newsletter. Uh, you can subscribe for free or get uh, every single newsletter we do for just eight bucks a month. That helps support what Brian and I are doing here on this podcast. If you are in this industry or you want to make sure that you see every single video that Brian and I and our colleagues do, you can sign up for an account for free on Collegiate Sports for Collegiate Sports Connect. And of course, you should subscribe to D1 Ticker, which is also free. It is by far the most comprehensive clipping service that touches this industry. If you want to know everything from what happened in one one local market to a school replacing their women's golf coach, by God, you will find it in D1 Ticker. It is literally the first thing I read every morning when I wake up. And And I'm not just saying that because I technically work there now. That was true even before I did. I got everything right. 
I, I think that's it. You know, it's fun. I've been been talking with some some ads. You know, it, it, the, the different approach to you know seeing the, the D one ticker. Everybody subscribes to it. Everybody reads to it. But it's like you know, I I can't start my morning until I get to the office and, and read D one ticker. Or others are like you, and it's like oh, it's the first thing I, I read when I wake up. But uh, you know, join join your own athletic directors and uh, start reading and at least get a better grip on all the changes that are happening uh, across the NCAA landscape because they are coming fast and furious. They're going to keep coming fast and furious given uh, some some of the kind of key dates that that we have coming up. And uh, I think uh, as, as well as the kind of in-depth stuff that you've been doing on NIL and for, for extra points, it's uh, definitely more, more than enough reasons for you to, you know, uh, signing up and uh, subscribing and, and rating us five stars as well. Uh, whether you're an Apple podcast or Spotify, uh, get, you know, give us those, uh, go on YouTube, give us the, the, the likes and the, and the thumbs up because uh, it does help, you know, truly uh, help uh, others in, in, in not only in college athletics, but others with interest in college athletics, find this podcast and, and uh, find some of the good work that we're, we've been doing. We can only afford to spend as much time as we do traveling and creating content and researching and reporting because of your support. Your athletic director definitely reads D1 Ticker. And if I, if we're being honest, your athletic director probably reads extra points too. Um, your AD might be reading it under a burner because they're afraid to let me know that they're reading it. And I just want you to know I'm on to your games. I'm a half decent reporter. I know how to, I, I can check some of those things. You should just let me know if you're reading. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you. In the meantime, folks, thanks for watching. Thanks for staying engaged with everything that we're doing. Brian, have a safe trip back to your home. We will be in touch with you all over the internet next week.